Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached to the juncture of that uh, that juncture of the conclave, where our esteemed panel members together will dive into various topics. And indeed, yes, these four points that I'm talking about are something that we're going to discuss upon. To begin with, we have the trending subject of reverse engineering to cultivate youth employability. Youth employability refers to the ability of young individuals to secure and maintain employment that aligns with their skills, qualifications, and aspirations. Skill gap amongst the youth is a burning issue, which is leading to a lot of obstacles like unemployment, underemployment, reduced competitiveness, limited career options, and lower earning potential. Reverse engineering, as applied to cultivate youth employability, involves analyzing and deconstructing existing successful career paths, skill sets, and professional attributes to guide and empower young individuals towards acquiring these necessary skills. It will only help us bridge gap between education and employment, empowering youth to embark on a successful career path. With immense pleasure, I would like to invite our esteemed speakers of this panel on stage. Please join me in welcoming them. Professor Anil Kashyap, Chancellor, Nikmar University, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, Founder Director, The Orchid School, Professor Kuldeep Praina, Vice Chancellor, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, Dr. Snehal Pinto, Director, Ryan Group of Schools, Professor Dishan Kamdar, Vice Chancellor, Frame University, and our moderator for this panel, and our very own Dr. Ashwin Fernandez, Regional Director at QS and CEO of QS iGage. This panel will discuss industry readiness being a catalyst for employability, bridging industry academia gaps to nurture sustainable careers and emphasize on adapting entrepreneurial mindset and industry academia collaboration for employability. Our esteemed panel members will be exploring the strategies to empower our youth and prepare them for the challenges of the job market. Over to you, Dr. Ashwin Fernandez. Okay, uh, I know we are over time and as, as a theme of the event is we are on a time-bound roadmap. But of course here today, uh, like the session today, we are running out of time. Uh, we are over, we are over the, we are ahead of, we are behind schedule. So we'll try to catch up. So uh, we will, please, I, I, will, I will stand, I will stand, it's okay. Yes, yes, please, please. Let's get one more chair up for uh, Professor Dishan. So I have with me five panelists. And this, uh, you know, when we discussed this theme with the, uh, the panelists yesterday, we wanted to do something a little bit unconventional, uh, and we wanted to discuss uh, the topic in a little bit more detail. Now, due to time, I am not going to read out all the, uh, the bios of all the speakers. I'm sure uh, you will meet them, and you, they, they, will, they will talk a little bit more about, you, about themselves to you. But what I want to do now is get into the theme, which is reverse engineer. Uh, what's the exact theme? But we have the. Uh, I'm just trying to. Reverse engineer to cultivate youth employability. Yes. So uh, this was very interesting, and the first thing is that: Do we really need to reverse engineer anything? Right. And uh, Sejal already gave a brief introduction of uh, uh, what are we looking to reverse engineer. So what is the problem statement? The problem statement is that the youth face enormous challenges in employment. And some of the statistics we have today is that the India Skills Report says that only 45.9% of Indian graduates were employable across all sectors, number one. The All India Council for Technical Education reported that around 60% of engineering graduates in India are unemployed or employed in jobs that do not require an engineering degree. Third, the National Employability Report states that 80% of engineering graduates in India are deemed unemployable for software development roles. Fourth, and which is why we're having a discussion today, is 65% of children entering primary school will ultimately end up working in completely new jobs. Now, this is by the World, uh, World Economic Forum. Now, what I want to do is first, I would like to go around my panel 
uh, with one, one, I just wanted to answer very briefly. Do we really need to re-engineer what we're doing right now? Uh, is it, and first, we'll, we'll go, to, go to your, what does the audience feel? Do we really need to re-engineer? A yes or a no? Yes? yes. All right. Uh, what, my panel, what does Dr. Anil uh, feel? You want to use yes. uh, sorry. Yeah, I, you are referring to re-engineering, whereas we are talking about reverse engineering. I do agree with the audience that uh, re-engineering is always a possibility, but I am not really supportive of the fact that uh, we have to re reverse engineer yes. the employability. We have to inculcate and make it part of the curriculum and part of the learning and part of the ecosystem so that employability is is coming on its own through that overall holistic experience of the students. It's not that we are creating students. There is a difference in a polytechnic and university, you know, where, where university is a holistic uh, um, learning and polytechnic I'm using from more of an English terminology where uh, uh, are there for short period of time, getting a skill, go into the sector and get employment. That's perhaps not the motive of an university, it's more holistic education, which I, I believe. And that is the reason that some of these successful universities, if you are part of that ecosystem, employability comes its on, on its own. And uh, I come from Nikmar University, and I'm really proud to, to share with the, the audience and the panelists here that almost 100% of our graduates get employed at the end of their, or even before they finish their degrees. So I perhaps uh, I'm so not in agreement on the reverse engineering, re-engineering, yes, always a possibility. Perfect. So already, uh, because the National Institute of Construction Management Research, uh, which uh, Dr. Anil represents, perhaps already produces people for the, for the, the workforce and it's, it's probably already re-engineered what is available uh, for, for graduates. And some of the statistics we have here today is very fo engineering focused. Uh, I will go to Dr. Lakshmi, because Dr. Lakshmi is involved in schools as well as in higher education. And I would like to see, does that connect from school to higher education? Uh, how important it is it? And what is the role of schools in this process? And do we really need to re-engineer something at the school level? Or do we need to some range to something at the higher education level? Whose responsibility is it? Oh my God, so many questions. <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, we are kind of the nursery for what you really want to reap in the higher education. So we got to have the seeds and build the appropriate environment for what would be eventually reaped in the labor market and workforce. So there is no denial of the role of school education in what we really uh, talk about the future uh, workforce. Uh, but when it comes to re-engineering, I would like to, no, reverse engineering, reverse engineering. yes. Uh, I would like to actually put more emphasis on the uh, two aspects of it. One is a design recovery and the implementation recovery. I think that's where the schools need to re-look at uh, you know, going beyond the agenda of certification and the scores. And we definitely would love to have the cooperation of the higher education to look at the redesign of how we need to look, uh, you know, uh, calibrate the school. Hence, I think I mentioned it yesterday also, that rather than the reverse engineering, that we need to look at the recalibration of our priorities and how we define the literacies that are ready. Uh, it's a whole gamut of paradigm shift from uh, you know, the way we design textbooks to the way we deliver the teaching and learning process and the, the ever heart-burning issues of assessments that are so outdated and finally churning the results that really don't have any representation of students' competencies and capacities. Having said that, uh, there is whole huge space possible for reverse engineering. But in all this, I think since a lot of higher education, uh, you know, communities sitting here, and uh, f we just spoke about it, it's very heart burning. 
that no one talks about in all this reverse engineering, re-engineering, recalibrating teacher education. And you know, if I can just frighten you, your children and grandchildren may not have teachers in the classrooms. And if we do not invest in that uh, you know, agenda, big universities and uh, liberal arts programs, a meaningful teacher education, lot of would be about you know, uh, trying to milk the bull. Thank you. I want to go, because you mentioned liberal arts there, and uh, I want to go immediately to Professor Dishan because uh, you did mention, you know, we need to recalibrate the system. Uh, and we already have a liberal arts uh, school here on the panel, so I thought it was appropriate to jump directly to Professor Dishan Kamdar, who's the Vice Chancellor of Flame University. Uh, what, is, what is your take? Re reverse engineering <coughs> or re engineering slash calibration? Uh, because at the end of this session, we want to come back to you and say, well, maybe the theme, even though it says reverse engineering, we are exactly not looking at reverse engineering anything. We're looking at recalibrating the system and looking at, uh, at the skill sets in this case. Sure, Ashwin. Um, this is a very important discussion. Well, I, I would like to use the word redesigning here. Right? Okay. We are continuously evolving uh, as, as institution. And why are we continuously evolving is because there exists an industry academia gap. And let's not run away from this topic. Industry is always saying, look, the students that you produce, the students that get into the job market are not equipped with the skills that we need. And that problem continues to be persisting and that gap continues to be, you know, getting wider and wider with the passage of time. And let's step back, you know, uh, for two minutes. You know, education is evolving, technology is also evolving, but the pace of evolution is different. Technology is evolving at a greater speed. I mean, think about all of us here. When we attended our schools, you know, it was more of a theater. It's, it's like entering a theater where, where, where the teacher is imparting knowledge and students are receiving knowledge. Then we moved to a world where flipped classrooms were there, right? A pure disruption. And, uh, and then came the MOOCs of the world. And then today, thanks to generative AI, we have personalized tutoring, as you mentioned, personalized tutoring for every student who don't need any teachers today, right? So we need to just redesign the role of different stakeholders within the education fraternity here. What is the role of a teacher? What is the role of a student? What is the role of a university? And unless and until, so you talked about responsibility, whose responsibility it is to redesign my word, I think it's a collaborative effort. A student has a role to play, faculty has a role to play, universities have a role to play, and unless and until industries do not come into universities and co-create this journey, we will not be able to, you know, uh, reduce this gap. Now, um, you know, think about uh, a student today. When we were students, things were very certain. You know, I'm going to major in this subject, and these are a five, subject, five career path, and they are there. Today's student, our children, your children out here, you know, we talk about anxiety moments, anxiety pangs. Why are they so anxious? Because they are not even too sure, you know, whatever they major in would exist when they graduate. The jobs that are thinking about, half of them would perish by the time they are getting into the job market. Right, so we are evolving so fast. And when we were studying, probably we would change one or two jobs within the same industry in our lifespan. Then came a time that we would switch five jobs in our lifespan. Today's children will not be sweeping, uh, sw switching jobs. They'll be switching four to five careers in their lifespan. Right? This is the world we are living in today. So there needs to be a redesigning element, but I don't want to take time from my other panelists, but I can go on and on. But this redesigning element where students, faculty, industry has to come together and obviously the university in recharting, recreating the path of a student going forward. Excellent. So uh, based on that, you, you, you came up with a new word, redesigning uh, the, uh, the framework. Yeah. Now, you also spoke of industry engagement, 
And with that, I would like to go to Dr. Snehal Pinto, because she mentioned a statistic yesterday, which I used in my uh, report today, is 65% of children entering primary schools today will ultimately end up in jobs that do not exist. So if we don't know what jobs, of course, Professor Dishan says we need to work with industry, but if we don't know what jobs are going to be there in the future, what is the role of schools then? And what do schools need to do? Do we, is there something to re-engineer or reverse engineer in the school education before you send them off to higher education? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for indulging us <laughs> as we discuss. Um, one of the things uh, I'm grateful for is this privilege of being able to discuss and uh, have conversations. So just so you know, on the other side, that we haven't arrived yet. <laughs> uh, we are still working our way onto this roadmap. And um, I gave you that statistic yesterday, Ashwin, and there's another alarming one um, I came across, and that is um, about between 1999 and 2013, um, we had over quite a 30% growth in the global youth population. However, the labor force participation rate decreased by approximately 12%. And this is uh, the World Economic Forum. And if you go on to those reports, you'll get. What is the role of the school? And I, I uh, resonate with uh, Professor Dishan in the sense of it requires a collaborative effort, for sure. Uh, do we need reverse engineering, redesigning, revisiting, re recalibrating, re everything? It's time to rethink and revisit the basics, really going back to the drawing board. Because is employability the outcome? And if, is, if employability is the outcome, then at school, our priorities change. Um, you have to understand school is the hub of uh, social, emotional, um, personal development, holistic skill sets um, being nurtured, values being imparted, knowledge being transacted, co-created, in all of that happening in a span of eight hours a day. But more work gets done outside the classrooms than within them. And within the school is where the skill set development happens. Resilience, adaptability, agility, collaborativeness, uh, you know, working together. Put them in a P period, teamwork comes into uh, action. Leadership roles come into action. Give them uh, tasks, uh, and more than now giving them, it's student agency. Students have now, this generation is so articulate and, and fearless. They come forward, and I liked what Professor uh, Gosavi said and, and Professor Kamakoti said, they are coming forward. They have, they, they have a sense of activism and they want to take up the causes. So you'll see Kaizen circles in schools uh, endeavoring to solve issues within the school circle and beyond. And so to answer your question, Ashwin, within the school, um, we have all the stakeholders working together to ensure that in order to equip our children with the skill set to adapt and be agile in a changing world and transform this landscape and this ecosystem. Uh, our job is not, uh, not really a job. We endeavor to equip them with skills to not just adapt and be agile, but also uh, work together. Um, also, um, the technical, the digital skills, the soft skills. I like what uh, you said yesterday about the soft skills. How do you conduct yourself? And um, what uh, Professor Gosavi said about character building. Uh, you don't get to hear that very often. We want progress. We want to be a four trillion economy. What is the cost? At what cost? Are we going to have uh, cutthroat uh, individuals or are we going to have humane leaders who forge a path for the generations to come? Um, and all of this happens, you know, um, schools are just incubators for that kind of development. But really, it's connecting the school with the higher ed um, needs 
the higher ed with the industry needs and then working across. Uh, and I think in that aspect, I would embrace reverse engineering. Okay. So well said there. Uh, you, you did mention about the student of today is so different from that uh, many years ago. And I'm, ke I'm keep, keep hearing this from the panel. Now, earlier today, earlier uh, I had mentioned some statistics and now I want to go to Dr. Kuldeep Raina, uh, who represents uh, an applied sciences university, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences. And this is where some of the statistics are alarming and you have a strong engineering program as well. So is it time for us in India to reverse engineer or re-engineer or redesign or relook at how we are conducting these courses and is it that employability in its true sense right now is what we need to <coughs> work, on, work on? Uh, thanks uh, Ashwin and QSI Gage for asking Ramaya to represent in this wonderful discussion. It is heartening that we have the community uh, from technical, non-technical school and higher education as well. But uh, my personal view uh, is, uh, let us not say whether it is design, engineering or whatever. I think there's a need for RE. Okay. R -E. Whether you do engineering, reverse engineering or designing, I think that needs to be deliberated. I think in the concluding remarks we may come across various panel discussion of what it is. I personally feel, having been in ed engineering education for nearly three and a half decades now, it takes hard to make someone engineer so that he gets a B.Tech degree, finds a better job. And later, we say we have to re-engineer. That means, are we re-engineering him or ourselves? I think as a whole ecosystem of education, from primary, to secondary to tertiary, I think we have to put it in one ambient. Forget about whether I'm in university, I think education is at the core first. My personal assessment is there's a need for a change at all levels. Who comes to us is 18 years plus. And what he has learned in 18 years, is he going to read that and come across something new as well? Employability, what is the theme of this discussion is, there is an employment, but I think we suddenly rise in the morning, there is employment because newspaper reporters say so. I think most of us who work in the higher education institutions, we have strong placement departments and all that. The problem comes, not in the, there, are, there are no jobs. I think there are jobs. But we have not equipped our people, the students, so that they grab those jobs. If you look at the advertisements from the premier institutions, each one says 2.5 crore, 1.7 crore and 85 lakhs and all that. Where from the jobs come and how many people? are there to attract it. We need to fine tune our processes from the school education itself. And who comes to us, how much have we nurtured him to make him agile to learning? I think that's where the gap is. Friends, I tell you, in our education system the, the I come from, I was never taught, of, taught marketing, I was never taught business, I was never taught what you have to do. It is go in a unilateral direction. So we need to have unilateral as well as the displacements in the education processes too. Since we represent schools and the higher education institution as well, how many of us are interacting at each level? My academic council is my academic council. I may have two or three people from the corporate, but does it represent the corporate in general? Perhaps no. Do I also incorporate the school principles in my academic council? Perhaps not. So they don't know what we are doing and we don't know what they are doing. This lateral relationship between them and us needs to be enhanced. But when it comes to, in my opinion, employment, I think there are more jobs than the students we have. We have to create an ecosystem working together with the corporates, what their needs are. We don't, we, we don't do the need analysis at times. Once we do so, I think this is the best place to work. And what we have seen in the last few years, that startup, stand up and all those things, India certainly is there. We at Ramaya, what initiatives we have taken, I will just share two bullets with you. One, we have made entrepreneurship innovation as a common course for all undergraduate students across. These used to be the programs in the engineering education at seventh or eighth semester level, where there were some interest just to get the grade. But we introduced it 
across the university in the third semester and fourth semester alternate so I then we also look at having the startups getting them introduced to that and the evaluation is not a three-hour examination I think it is going to be the project based assessments and the evaluation which I will not be doing I will call the industry experts corporate people who will assess them and evaluate them we took these initiatives another thing research is very very important component in an academic system today if you go to QS ranking or times or others I think research and innovation contributes nearly 30 percent how many of we are doing that kind of an extraordinary research that's why there is only a fixed ambit that group of institutions who come always one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two three four five not beyond that what initiatives we have taken in Ramaya very glad to share with you we invested around three crore rupees this fund last financial year for seeding the research on the university campus in addition to other facilities we empowered every faculty member by writing a research proposal before they go to DST they go to Iraq they go to other organizations let them have an in inclusion in this working unit second we created 70 fellowships I was very happy to listen to professor Kamuti that come quoted that create those things we have 40 GRFs supported by us 30 sorry 20 SRF is supported by us and 10 postdoctoral fellowships full-time research fellowships so I think totally we have to work I won't say this is the best model but I think the initiatives have been taken at Ramaya University in, of Appalachian Bangalore that how we can empower own people give them the chance give them the choice and student support systems are very much needed I stop here maybe yes, in the second round I will speak something more thank you very much so I've noted of all the all the work you're doing uh, you know to empower employability but what about and I think I'm going to go back to the back to and we can anyone in the panel could, could take this uh, by how, how do we actually support the students to actually have the right soft skills because that is when when they get into higher education they will be of course ready in this case for uh, for for the work of all the higher education institutions I'm talking about uh, you know having the right empathy looking at uh, the emotions uh, looking at uh, sustainable uh, uh, sustainability and so on because all those and even, even financial planning uh, life lessons and and th they could be various other skills so maybe from the school side I would either like to ask either Dr. Lakshmi or Dr. Uh, Dr. Snail to if you would like to take that and elaborate whether we, do we need to re-engineer that and make it part of the whole curriculum yeah, I think uh, we were just saying we already are. Uh, you know, I think a couple of decades ago when NASCOM used to talk about the employability and push this agenda in the higher education for four years and five years, uh, they felt exasperated that time is not enough. And uh, we knew that this will get pushed on to the senior secondary level. And I think the 9 to 12 is wonderful, uh, ready uh, youth, uh, you know, attitude uh, to work with. So if you were to look at, you know, there are, you know, while the future looks very fuzzy and, uh, you know, we don't know if these jobs will exist and if those knowledge system would be still very relevant. But I think there are some timeless uh, employability checklist, it's available. And I think, uh, Snehal, you mentioned quite a lot of that. And I think we got to really incorporate that into this ecosystem of education of the senior secondary. The second one that I see is that of interdisciplinarity. I think Professor Kamakoti mentioned it. While we have the math and the science and the social science lessons, uh, but when it comes to you know, NEP thankfully saying that let's blur the boundaries and let's not offer the science stream and commerce stream and the art stream and with those streaming we also stream our prejudices of you know the sciences all there and arts is not so you know fantastic and high on iq but we know that a very high on iq science requires a humane and social responsibility skills so i think that blurring of boundaries is one of the best gifts that nap has given as usual schools will take time to embrace and parents will take even more time and I think that's where I also think uh, what you spoke about this interconnectedness between the higher education 
and the uh, school education. Because today, when uh, my parents come, you know, for example, we don't have any more the art and science stream. We have one subject that's compulsory, language, and 14, 15 subjects from which to take. And children come to me and say, what if I do biology, physics, and, you know, entrepreneurship, and let's say history, where will I land? And we don't know really where this kid will land in a mainstream university. So I think that uh, the, the quickness with which the reforms happen in the schools also need to catch up in the higher education in terms of the entry point. Uh, last but not the most, uh, not the least, is really looking at the ethics and the model. And it almost feels like you know <clears throat> it's the school's responsibility. But again, you know, taking borrowing what you said, it's an extremely collaborative uh, endeavor that if you do not create that ethical uh, and morally aligned community of employable youth, I think we would end up with an agenda of, you know, probably great economy, but all put to very wrong usage. So it's not an either or situation anymore. It's a very, very and paradigm. And uh, we are already on that path. Just to give you one example, in grade 12 and 11 and 10, we actually started doing what you call the mandatory on climate literacy. I mean, it's not in the textbook. I know CBSC doesn't even offer a subject on this, but we don't wait for it. For example, a financial literacy. Of course, our kids, you know, the new generation is going to live on experiences and they want to live on plastic money. Who the hell is going to teach them on that? So there is an important thing. And the huge data literacy to know that there is no more space on I feel, I think, and I opine. What does the data say and how do we create the decision? So you have enormous landscape and a possibility and don't wait for people to tell you or the system to tell you, make it compulsory and make it a subject, but infuse it. And I think interdisciplinary approach gives you a wonderful tool. Just to add to that, um, if you see over the past five years, it is uh, students who have driven the need for change. So um, schools have already, and I'm sure there are schools here um, who may not be in your top 10 of the country, but thank God for the schools in this country that endeavor to do their bit in, in no matter how obscure parts of India they are placed in. Um, financial literacy, digital literacy, uh, digital skill development, um, women empowerment through the micro enterprises, um, adopting villages and teaching literacy, numeracy to the citizens there. I think those kind of efforts on ground are already happening, Ashwin, uh, within the school system. It's not mandated, it's not uh, uh, marked or certified, but it is an endeavor by the schools who, who you know, who feel who have that sense of social responsibility and thereon starts the connect. Then what happens? And I liked what you said, ma'am, about the, what happens at the entry point of the universities, the mainstream universities that they get into. And I think that's where we need the collaborative effort for higher ed initiatives as well as school education to work together to meet the changing dynamic needs of student population that's going to be your employable youth of the future. So what I'm hearing is that uh, while we are looking at uh, re-engineering or reverse engineering, the collaboration between schools and higher education needs to improve at a starting point. So what is stopping us from doing it? Right? If you want to re-engineer it, reverse engineer it, uh, maybe, okay, um, yeah, Dr. Actually, Raina, will yeah, it is. Uh, it is not who stops. I think we stop it. Let us come closer. My my first endeavor suggesting to QSI Gage and Dr. Ashwin is, you know, let us come to the rural school. Have such events there. It's a proposal. You know, I, I know you had own limitations, because you know when we when we discuss such things, in wonderful areas, it remains there. By the time we go back there is a damping effect happening in each one of us, I tell you, very honestly. I think we, unless and until we collaborate with the stakeholders, discuss and deliberate with them, learning is easy. Real learning becomes sometimes difficult because the mindset is like that only. 
unlearning. That's why I said re, 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 I don't know, so what should add to it? Adjectives are so many, so many. I think there is a need for us, each one of us in the higher education sector, in the school sector too, because what is your output is my input and what is my output is the corporate uh, input. Are we synchronizing at all these levels or not? I think we are not doing great. We are doing a bit, but not great. In that context, there is a need to have such conclaves in various schools, in various colleges, so that the larger fraternity of our own young minds are brought into the fold. They know what we are doing. Otherwise, this gap, like you used to teach, energy band gap between valence band and semi -gand band, it becomes so insulative. Let us try to make it in a conducting range, so that what we discuss, what we deliberate, they know that it is in the interest of the community, in the interest of students. Once these things happen, I think collectively, the message goes across the community. Second, uh, you know, I think some institutions are, you know, because since in the last couple of years, editor companies are playing a very, very proactive role. They say, we will enhance your soft skills. But I have felt that soft skills do not come only at the time of interview or the placement sessions. This soft skill is inbuilt in somebody. It starts from the school itself. And the diversity of our schools in this country is so wide. Sometimes you say outreach, outreach is so broad. You have the best of the schools here. I will not name them because I have not publicized you for any school, but I am concerned about the children in those schools. You have a school which can charge up to two lakhs per month from a student in the primary class. You also have a school where the fees is only 20 pence or two rupees. This diversity, for whom are you creating the ecosystem of education? So for that, do these children, they are brilliant. What Professor Kamukoti said in Tamil Nadu, they started with a model. I think those students are now growing up and growing up. In my perception too, the best of the grade levels are in the ruler schools. But they do not know, they don't have that kind of confidence to come on the stage and speak. I think let us try to create an ecosystem, go to that grassroots level. Bottom-up approach of creating the better learning set, skill sets is need of the hour. I think I, as chairperson of the Academic Council of my university, I'm sure that the learning that I'm going to take from here is the next meeting. I will also invite some schools as invited members in our Academic Council and the Board of Studies too. I assure you, it will be done from my side. Because there is a constitution, Board of Studies will have this, this, this. Yes, yes. I, I will have to stop you there we for are, limited yeah, yeah. time. Yeah, I am going to stop. You, so, uh, so, I think we can try that and see what are going to be the success stories. Thank you very see, much, Ashwin. It, it's good to know that you have talked of rural schools and I think I will directly come to Dr. Kashyap here because uh, you are a National Institute of Construction Management and Research and I think you are open, uh, you, you have students coming in from not just urban areas. I think a lot of the discussion we've had of students being proactive, have access to information, are privileged, are perhaps because we're looking at some of the, some of the cities where, uh, or where people are doing very well, uh, middle class. But what about rurals? And I think I would like you to, Dr. Anil, because you're a national institute, focus on where, uh, what, do, what, does, what does your institute or schools in rural area need to collaborate on to help fix this reverse engineering? Ashwin, um, the key here is uh, perhaps uh, um, to take a step back and understand this total ecosystem and I'm really more convinced uh, as, as uh, other panelists uh, speak about this integration of schools and, and uh, uh, the other education in with the universities and it, it's very much required and uh, thank you Dr. Raina, you have taken this as uh, um, one of the pledge here, um, I think it makes a lot of sense and, and it will give us uh, some food for thought for uh, how we can actually include. Coming back to your rural um, schools and rural kind of uh, folks uh, coming into, um, um, into higher education and uh, like, you know, in infrastructure sector and all, it is all accessible, um, various schemes are there, we have got similar schemes of fellowships, etc. Where we actually uh, promote our accessibility. Also, uh, looking at some of the points which Dr. Rajesh Saxena was talking about was was quality and global accreditation. 
you know, those are so important uh, to keep the benchmarks uh, at uh, that global level and uh, create a confidence of any institution to get into there. Because we need to have that confidence that because of the multiplicity of uh, institutions, uh, people have got very limited time to choose and uh, limited information. But I think if we have got that benchmark set up, uh, uh, accreditation is, is one of the starting you know, point. Uh, last two things are also important. This faculty development is so important because uh, this uh, re-engineering should happen from this faculty development as well. We are thinking faculty as more as a teaching resource. I think this research element, which is very much uh, 30 to 40 percent of any ranking, um, need to be emphasized by the leaders of institutions that this this is embedded and the faculty actually deliver that research, deliver that hands on real life situation into the classroom where the students get engaged. And the final point is soft skills. It's not soft skills, I would extend this to as in transferable skills. Transferable, transferability can happen beyond the soft skills. If you are thinking of uh, solving a maths problem and that maths problem can be applied into solving something which is computer science, which is civil engineering. So it is all about uh, that kind of transferability and and as uh, you know, one of the panelists, Dr. Snehal said, the school students, when they come into higher education in the university in say five to, ten, five to seven years of period, those jobs may not be there where they are thinking of today. Uh, so that's where this transferable skill, transferability is so important. So if we get that into this bigger ecosystem, I think we are, we are automatically addressing the, the employability aspect automatically. Uh, great. So you've addressed employability, but still the bigger question remains on how we could support rural India. So I will keep that aside for now because uh, you touched upon, um, you touched upon uh, transferable skills. And one of the challenges of the system so right now is that when, ca when students go out of higher education, they don't have the desire for lifelong learning. And the, the, the lifelong learning as, unless they are curious, of course, to learn, but how do we change the system or reverse engineer the system or redesign the system to make them, and I would go to Dr. Professor Dishan for this, to make the students to be lifelong learners because when you're out of the system, you're out of the system, there's nothing which brings you back every year, every two years, every three years for some kind of a reskilling, re enhancement, uh, you know, re, uh, redesigning program for them. So does that need to happen and do you think you all are doing something differently at, uh, at Flame? Sure, Ashwin, I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, you know, we just talked about upskilling, we've talked about unlearning, relearning, and I had also mentioned that the industry is moving at a very fast speed here. Um, you know, it is our responsibility, you know, and, um, you know, usually during my convocation speech to students, you know, I tell them that uh, I'm not saying goodbye to you because you're just shifting your responsibility from a student to an alumni, and we're going to be holding your hands throughout your entire education journey. So what's the purpose of education? The purpose of education is to create responsible leaders who are skilled enough to take India forward. That's the purpose. Right? And students' sense of purpose will keep changing and skill sets that are required in the industry will keep on evolving. And unless and until universities set aside a budget in ensuring that your alumni are upgraded on a continual basis, this problem will not be solved. So at Flame University, you know, we invest in our alumni. Right? The alumni uh, team is, is you know, very active. Um, you know, we keep in touch with all our students, we keep track of where they are. So alumni plays two roles, right? So our responsibility is twofold. Number one, we need to provide you lifelong learnings. So we engage actively with all the different chapters within India and international uh, alumni as well. And we ask them, rather than we, you know, thinking about skill sets they need, every chapter has its own personality. Every chapter will have their own requirements. So rather than top down, it's going to, it is a bottoms up approach at Flame University. Alumni from a, from a chapter will tell us, look, these are the four skill sets that we need. Can you offer training and development programs? And we offer them without any cost. 
we invest in our alumni because in their success lies our student success. But what do we want in return? You know, remember as they say, there's no free lunch, right? <laughs> so we are investing in your education, we are upskilling you, but what we ask from our alumni is just be a mentor to your younger brother and sister who's currently undergoing their undergrad and their postgrad at Flame University. You know, we have been talking about re-engineering and reskilling, but I think one big piece is mentorship. You know, mentorship is so critical. The purpose of undergrad education, if you ask me, the sole purpose is providing the right mentorship to students. If all of us, including me, we all need mentors. We are here today because of the mentorship we've received. So what we have done at Flame University is to tag every student to an alumni. Right? Just imagine, I mean, we're not there yet, but our big wish list is every student should have three numbers 24 by 7, three people where they can contact, right? Someone from the industry, someone from the academic fraternity, and a peer mentor. Just imagine if every student has three people, three individuals that they can speak to 24 by 7, their sense of purpose will be recalibrated through these discussions that they have, right? I mean, I, I say, if, you know, I, before Flame University, I was the deputy dean at the Indian School of Business, ISB. And, uh, you know, 70% of students at ISB join ISB because they are career switches. You know, I'm bored doing this, but now after my MBA degree, I can move into another industry. So when I ask my students, you know, why are you investing so much of money, right? Um, and what would be that one, if you could undo something, what would you undo? And the common response I get is, if I had received sound mentorship from someone in my undergrad days who do a SWOT with me, a SWOT analysis and say, hey, you know what, these are your strengths, these are your weaknesses, and I think, you know, these are the fields that you might right, be more interested to pursue, probably, you know, I may not be investing my 50 lakhs right now being a career switcher. So mentorship is an integral piece that we are missing out here, and I think schools, right, should actively engage in mentorship, which will make a very big difference to a student's lifestyle and sense of purpose. That's very interesting. Um, yeah. Does anybody from the, from the schools, Dr. Lakshmi, would, would like to t touch upon that? Because lifelong learning starts at the school, and how, uh, how do you cultivate that, the inner sense of always wanting to learn and never wanting to be content that you know, I'm, I'm all, I'm, I'm know it all? So <clears throat> one of the um, secret formula that I think that works is uh, to show the roadmap of uh, what's the outcome if it's a lifelong learning and not learning for exams. Because kids ask you that a portion exam may aayega kya? You know, then their whole mind frame is shrunk to just get the content, just by heart this and finish it. Whereas we say that this is something that's going to come to you as a human being, as an individual, as an employee workforce, as a you know, leader, and as probably as a mentor, and also as a productive, uh, contributing, positive citizen of this universe, I see a greater interest. So I think as leaders, as educational leaders, we need to show them the far beyond the lighthouse picture and not this immediate narrow that, you know, this is going to come in CBC exam for two marks and six marks, but low. Unfortunately, we are constantly minimizing the education agenda to this certification. I think we need to look at a bigger canvas, bigger picture called life beyond school. Uh, also, I'm not sure if this works, but also questions are changing in the classroom. Uh, you know, of what is going to come to the test seems to come more from the parents than the children. The children are asking, why am, why, why am I learning this? Uh, will this come in handy and will this be of use to me when I move out of school? Um, they are very articulate as to why am I doing what I am doing. You need to explain this to me and that's where the big picture comes in. And I, I duly note uh, Professor Dishan's uh, need for mentoring at the high school level. 
uh, and I think at the high school level is where they are more receptive to uh, understand and they are more, um, you know, they want to know. Uh, this generation um, is refreshingly dynamic and I am completely uh, with the whole concept of mentorship. Um, we all need a mentor. Each one of us has not arrived here in a vacuum. We have all had, a, you know, someone who has played a role in shaping our belief system, our convictions, our decision making, and here we are. And the kids are actually looking for that voice of affirmation, direction, and clarity. Uh, show them the big picture. Tell them that this is an uncertain uh, future you are charting into. Uh, but the skills that you develop now at school of research, of not doing chat GPT for your work, and if you're doing it, make sure you credit the source duly. But, uh, you know, academic honesty, um, collaboration, um, critical thinking, problem solving, all of that comes, uh, it starts here, but there's, there's a voice of affirmation that lets them, uh, that takes them on to that direction that they want to go. They, we have entrepreneurs in our school system. I promise you there are children in the 9th and the 11th grade who own florist shops, who are designing web pages. They are entrepreneurs at this age. Now, they want to know, do I continue with this or can I take two other things that I love doing, like coding, and can I do some more mm. with my life? And, and that's why I, I like what Professor Dishan said. There are going to be five careers they play with. Uh, and for them, it's, they are risk takers. How am I, who is of a generation or two beyond, going to facilitate and support that? Because it doesn't, it doesn't fit in my box, does it? Yeah. And, and that is where the whole unlearning comes in and relearning to adapt to what's coming up comes in. And I think that's where our role comes in as coaches and, and facilitators and mentors. So that's my two cents. Thank you so very much. Our time for a like just add, uh, time bound uh, roadmap should, should, is almost just, come just to a an minute, end. Just a minute, just a minute. You know, I think our objective should not be only awarding the degrees. I think we should assess what is the learning behind the degree. That is where there is a gap. And those transferable skills will come, they become a part of the total integrative system of gaining the credits. If this degree has to be 160, 180, 210 credits, what is the learning in that? How do we assess? And in my opinion, Three hours examination of the final is not the end of everything. I think it is a beginning. But before that, how have we assessed, evaluated, needs to be re-engineered, mm -hmm. re-looked, re-assessed, re-evaluated, redesigned. That is the final conclusion from me, uh, Dr. Rashmi. Thank you. Okay, so I, I do hear a lot of thoughts here. And of course, the last one is really important is the assessments. Because that is where, you know, the, the mindset, of course, is probably changing. Maybe in the big... Um, I'd like to thank my panel. There are lots of topics uh, and food for thought for us for the future. And one of them is the collaboration between higher ed and schools. The extended collaboration with the industry. Getting the soft skills, empathy, uh, life lessons into the... Uh, into the curriculum and of course beyond what we're looking at today is not just reverse engineering because it seems to be a working machine is to redesign the system a bit re-engineer the system a bit and continue to to take this forward so thank you so very much i would like to summarize more but i know we are very really much over time and as again the title is a time bound roadmap so we have to we have to uh, keep that in mind so thank you a uh, really uh, pleasure to uh, to moderate this panel and we should continue this discussion in a third tier city uh, where we are working with some of these smaller schools i think it's a greater responsibility for our panelists here today to support schools beyond the metropolis into into some some other smaller town so i think that's a task for qsi gauge is to go into the heartland of india yeah thank you so very much